How can we redefine our perceptions on the meaning of true career success in a way that is beneficial to our mental health? So we're really looking at true career success in relation to mental health. And I'm not going to tell you which person should start talking. I think um, you want to take a second, and then anyone can go. Um, it's fine. <laughs> I don't want to tell you how to get moving. I mean, I can push you. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll take a stab at it. So I had a similar experience. My, my, I play. I'm a musician. And I play an instrument called the euphonium, which is a, a very, a, it's a non-traditional brass instrument. You don't find them in orchestras, and the only place you find them with a regular job is in uh, military bands. And so when I decided I wanted to pursue this instrument, it was clear that, well, this is what you're going to go do, because that's the only option, um, dot, 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 if you're going the traditional route. But no one ever gave me the dot, dot, dot part. I had to figure that part out. And so I just, I pursued uh, throughout my undergrad and halfway through my master's, I won a position with the Air Force Band in Washington, D.C. And I had reached this pinnacle of my career. I just thought this is the thing that you go do. And I had achieved this goal by the time I was 23 years old. I got the thing exactly that I wanted. And then I was doing this job for a couple of years and it occurred to me, oh, I don't like this at all. At all. <laughs> And, but now what? Because this was, to me, the only option. And it was a real um, um, tug of war in my mind about, well, I'm supposed to, and, and outwardly everybody was saying, you should be celebrating this, and you should be um, um, uh, relishing this, and you should just hang out for as long as they'll let you. You, know, you generally spend about 20-ish years in one of those bands, and then go on to go do something else. And it just rubbed me the wrong way. It was not, I was, it was clearly, I was clearly the wrong shaped object in the wrong shaped hole. And uh, it took quite a, I mean, many years, I, I, many, I was in the group for just over seven years. If you aren't familiar with military bands, you, for the Washington DC bands, the premier bands, you win an audition just like you would win for an orchestral position. And then after that, you go to basic training and then you, you serve uh, just like anyone in the military does. And so I, every three or four years is when you would have to decide whether to uh, continue. And I, I just knew in my gut that it was not a good fit and I had no real clear idea of what else I would go do. But I knew that where I was was not the right place. And it was a very difficult thing to tell my colleagues and my teachers and my family that it was not the right fit for me. And it was a bad, it was a lot of undue stress and a lot of um, just anxiety and unhappiness because I was chasing someone else's version of what success mm -hmm. looked like or should look like. This is the instrument that you play, therefore this is the pinnacle of what you should go do. And I realized that metaphorically, I had much different music that I wanted to play. And so I made the decision to leave and and I've, I've faced that, it's about a, it's every seven-ish years, I face some sort of point where I realize that the path that I'm on and the job that I'm in start to part ways. And the notion that there is one definition of success for any of us and or one definition of success that, that maintains throughout your life or the, your career is not my experience. And I don't know many people for whom that is the experience. And so having really difficult, I spent a lot of time praying and reflecting about these decisions to, to leave whatever position I was in. And I, ultimately, I just had to have faith that what, what I had done enough work and that I had established a level. Uh, one of the ways I describe it to students here is that I had to climb this mountain, which was to get into the Air Force Band. To, and I don't regret having done it. I learned incredibly, incredibly valuable skills, but I had to climb that mountain to gain the perspective to see where it was that I wanted to go. And it was only through that climb that I had that perspective. And so then it opened all these other doors and made it possible for me to go do these other things. So the, 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 the effort wasn't wasted, the, the work wasn't wasted, but it just, it wasn't, it wasn't 
when I finally tuned in to what was important to me, it occurred to me to look around and realize, oh, I need to be over there. So some of what Lance talked about here kind of reminds me of you know, what you were saying earlier about your own trajectory and kind of discovering, uh, maybe this isn't what I had planned on, and maybe you could address that. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think as you were speaking, Lance, so much resonated um, with me in terms of when you think about um, success or you think about your career, many of you obviously students and about to graduate potentially as well. So you're thinking about this is sort of like a beginning of this long kind of linear path of a career, but it's not linear and it's very jagged and, and it's unexpected and you don't know where it's going to lead and that can be, you know, terrifying or exciting or it's an amazing adventure or whatever way you want to describe that. Um, and I think um, I sort of both sides of it. I have this sort of linear sense in that um, we were at dinner earlier, and um, Warren was asking me about what I wanted, when I knew I wanted to be in fashion. Um, I have always wanted to do that since I was a child. Um, really little had this desire and passion for this field or this area. And I know that that's not true of everybody. I mean, as I talk to people over time, I know that that's really a gift that I really had that desire and I, you know, that's linear for me in terms of the field, in terms of what I pursued. Um, but similarly to um, your story, Lance, I mean, if you think about any field that any of you are in, any of you are in uh, there's this sort of pinnacle of whatever that job is that is supposedly got this label of success. Like if you, you know, become top of your field in the do as a doctor in the medical field, or if you become that famous designer with your own brand, that everyone starts wearing your clothes, then you are successful. Um, so I think that I, I definitely bought into that for sure um, early on, and I, I had that dream. I think most people um, in fashion, most of my students, do still have that dream. Um, and I ended up going into the field working for um, a company designing knitwear, traveling over the world, had an amazing experience. Um, and then at the same time, I was also um, being a critic and going back to school and back to Parsons and being invited back to work with students. And I loved doing that and was asked to potentially consider teaching, but I'm like, that's not for me. That's not something I could never see myself doing. Never say that because well, oftentimes that might be the exact thing that you end up doing. Um, but so long story short, I decided at one point in the industry was I was kind of thinking, I, I need to, I need a change, like you're saying, and you suddenly are like, I see a, a sense of shift. Um, so I went back over to Parsons and I talked to Tim Dunn at the time, who was, some of you may know who he is, uh, who um, su suggested that I start teaching and said that he had the perfect job for me. And was, I literally ran into him in an elevator. Um, they said he wasn't available, I was leaving, I'm going down in the elevator, the door's open, and he comes out and he said, this was meant to be. Um, come and talk to me, I have 10 minutes. So that's important too, because it's not always the planned things um, that really direct your career. You know, and as a Christian, obviously I don't feel anything is just random, but still, you know, that timing of me just seeing Tim and then him offering me this job set me on the trajectory into education. Um, there was another segue in between there that also where I did it in my own line um, for seven years. and had my own boutique, um, it was incredible. But uh, then we had 9-11. Um, no one could have predicted that. Um, no one could have predicted what would happen to a small business owner trying to build her um, her whole business in that moment. And what on earth, you know, nobody could figure out how to get through that. I didn't have those skills. Um, but again, there was, I needed to do that, I needed to do, um, to go through that experience of having my business, experiencing the dream for a little bit. Um, but also, we were talking earlier, and Lance was saying how much I, I gained in knowledge during that short period of owning my business, running a boutique, producing, selling overseas, so many facets that I learned that I didn't know I would need to go into teaching, um, that just to continue on in my career, and that ended up being the director of the program that I graduated from, which who plans that if you were sitting right on where I was then saying one day you're going to direct this program that you're graduating from. I could, I could never have predicted that. So I think that, I don't think this is really answering the question truly, but the balance of um, sort of mental health piece I think is also to just not define success narrowly 
um, but to think about all the pieces of yourself that maybe you're in this degree and it's very specific and that's the sort of trajectory of how you can think about success, but it's so much beyond that. I didn't go to school for, I don't have a degree in education and I became a full-time professor at one of the top, of the top school of fashion. I could never have predicted that. So you, you never know where it's going to take you, but I think just make sure that you continue to have a holistic view of everything, all your talents. There's so many talents that you have that maybe it may not be your major, but it, you may end up doing something completely different that you're absolutely perfect for. I'm learning from both of you, and uh, I, I think medicine is in some ways a kind of broader profession. There's like more kind of ways to climb institutions, but it also is vulnerable to the same messages that if you don't make this certain like level of achievement, then you somehow like, fail. Um, I want to say a little bit more about my own experience, and then uh, talk about maybe a little bit about mental health and as it relates to, to career, uh, because I'm a psychiatrist, and so that's <laughs> what I can talk about. Um, but I, I, when I was in medical school, I mentioned that I, my faith, you know, ultimately I think became a great resource, but it also, I came to realize that it had been a problem. I, I grew up a Christian, and I came to realize, and I still am realizing this, that the, the faith that I learned as a child and really embraced is what I might call um, the gospel of achievement and competence. Nobody called it that. I guess my word for it. But... Uh, this is how I describe it, and maybe that none of you here who are Christian can resonate this, but, but I, I did. It's basically that uh, God has saved you in Christ and has given you certain gifts and expects you to use those gifts for God's glory. And in your vocation, and you'll, you'll find yourself like doing great things. And if you don't use those gifts in the way that God wants you to use those gifts, then you'll, I mean, God may still accept you because of Christ, but you'll, you'll just never, like, really know what that, is, what that greatness is or that joy is. And, and uh, you, you won't do great things, and, and you'll basically be a kind of permanent disappointment to God. That was, like, what I pretty much, I wouldn't have said it in quite that way, but that was the fear that I was under when I was pre-med undergraduate and then a medical student and trying to like work within the medical system. Um, I began to realize that I was incredibly like um, not wanting to disappoint other people and uh, doing things in order to like appear um, competent and good and I was working hard. But also I didn't want to disappoint God because I thought he'd given me gifts and I thought that my job was to use these gifts. And I found that I was um, pretty lonely and pretty depressed and, and, and also I could never work hard enough to try to convince myself that, um, that, that I was doing the right thing. And in medical school, like I really did hit a point where like everything on the outside was going well, but I was kind of dying on the inside. And I went to therapy, which I would recommend for anybody in the situation, and that was really helpful. I also had a campus minister of sorts in the medical school at Harvard, who, uh, Bill Pearson, who would, would just tell me over and over again, you know, those messages that you get about success and achievement, like Harvard gives you those messages for sure, medicine gives you those messages, but those are like, those are messages of the world. They're like powers, that, and you can refuse those. If you don't have to listen to those, and that God loves you for just who, who you are. And as I thought about how I began to, to adjust, it was really a kind of settling into that truth that, that before all else, before my status as a medical student or later as a physician or as a professor, before anything else, that I'm loved and known by God. And that that's, that's the deepest truth about who I am. And, and that's how I think I would encourage any of us as we're thinking about uncertainty and career to, to be thinking about these questions, that ultimately the deepest truth of who we are is that God loves us and knows us, and, and we don't have to like, prove to God or to anyone else that like we are working hard enough or made it. Um, a couple other like, things, more, maybe a little more generally, that I would say about career and mental health, and uh, this came up in one of our your prior conversations um, uh, is that there's a distinction, I think, between career and vocation or calling. 
Um, and even in the words, like the word career just means path. Like it's the same word that we get our, our, our words carriage or car from. Like it basically is like the path. So if you're going from here to Philadelphia, your career of sorts is the Pennsylvania Turnpike. You know, like you're, like, but, but like the point is not the path when you're going someplace. The point is the, is the destination. Or maybe the path is the destination, but it's like, what are you, what are you wanting to do? What are you aiming for when you set out? And, and that's where I think the language of, of vocation or call can be really helpful. Um, certainly Christians have a way of understanding ourselves as called by God, but I think uh, those who aren't Christian can also, what does it mean to be called into a particular form of life, into service, into something that brings us to light, and to think of our work not just as career, like going someplace, but as what does it mean to, to be called? And I would argue that for Christians, um, that we're, it's not that we're specifically called to medicine or to fashion or to um, business or to you know, music or anything else like that specifically. But Christians understand just to be called to love, to love God and to be loved by God and to love others and to be loved by others and to love ourselves and to feel that love for ourselves. And, and, and that's our primary calling. That's, that's what we're called to do. And the career uh, emerges out of that, which is like hard to say in the abstract, but like, what does it mean to, to really be able to take the time, including maybe a gap year if that's necessary, or including like not committing to as much, you know, like that keeps us busy all the time. But to be able to take the time to know like, what is it that we're, what is it that our hearts are desiring? What is it that we're, that we're loving? Whom are we called to love? What is it that kind of is that thing that we, long for, you know, when we think about what we could do, you know, now or in the future. And I think that's where we begin to discover our, our vocation. Uh, so each of you has given a sort of reframe of what success is and what's come up here so far is like, it's, um, you've shifted more to you know, improving yourself to um, really thinking about your identity and that you are loved for who you are, loved by God for who you are, and thinking about a calling to serve, maybe to love others. Fiona, you talked about not defining success narrowly, and it may be something you didn't plan. Um, and then, along with that, I think you you uh, align very much with what Lance was talking about how. Success is not necessarily what somebody else says, right? That somebody outside of me says. And given these different definitions now, this kind of reframings of success, are you ready, everyone? Big question number two. Okay. Big question number two is, all right, so we, we have these different definitions of success that you're talking about. Um, let's try to like pull these together. How can college students now find, and, and this could be undergrads, grad students, find greater meaning and purpose in future career. So this all sounds very nice, for example, when, because you, I mean, let's face it, these are some pretty fancy titles, right? If you click on the bios, I'm going to, I'm poking you a little bit, all right? But, or, you know, it's great that you could, that we can say, you know, I did these things give you perspective. Now, but, but remember being in that student position, so how do, we, how do we address that question of how do we help our, our students, ourselves, to talk about finding greater meaning and purpose? And what I heard was look within yourself, not listen to others. I also heard look outside of myself to God so I just wanted to set the stage a little bit more and get you all talking to each other maybe. Does that help? <laughs> I mean, I think I was thinking about this question, um, and it's so much pressure on all of you. I'm thinking back to student Fiona, you know. I mean, I was already at a big name school, so you're all at a big name school, so already here. But um, so there's pressure already there, like, what you know? the pressure of like, I don't know, succeeding from that program or whatever. And I think that the first step um, 
it, it, there's a sense of like, you know, the, the weight of that first step, you know, it's going to be right, it's going to be wrong, or whatever step I take next is going to like then predetermine where I'm going to go, which if I think back to like my actual first job, it was for a brand new company startup that was dissolved within a year. So that wasn't a really great, and nobody heard of it. So it wasn't a famous brand. And I remember the conversations with my peers about at the time, do we go into that you know, top designer brand name or pick the equivalent in your field? Um, or do I go over here, like when it you start talking about money, you know, I could make more money in a more mass produ produced brand or whatever that equivalent is in your field. Or, you know, I'm trying to like figure that out, you know, but I'm going to be put in a box and that's going to mean I can't do X, Y, Z later. And it felt very much like pressure, like I have to do the right thing. And I think that just has to be like blow that up and like get rid of that. And I know it's terrifying to, to believe that right now, but it's true because I really didn't go there. I went to this no name brand. I went to some other not so great brand, and, but I had amazing experience in knitwear and shopping all over the world. And I, you know, it didn't matter. And then I started my own label, and then I ended up at Parsons in this prestigious school. So if you're trying to argue, like I never had the credentials, truly is what I'm trying to say, uh, on paper in a resume, and still. It's complicated if you ever become a full-time faculty. It's a complicated place. So yes, you could look at my resume, and I'm sure plenty of people do, and say, how did she get here? How did Fiona become the director of the BFA program? Because my rank title wasn't right. I was an assistant professor. All of the things on paper in academia that got me that job, that should have gotten me that job, I, I didn't have. But I felt like, going back to what Warren was saying, um, very much um, compelled by vocational calling in my life. And when I think about my career path, I'm not thinking, where am I going to go next to be the most successful? I'm, I am praying. I am seeking to hear from God, like, where do you want, where do you want me, God, to be the most use for others? How can you use my gifts and talents to serve uh, this place, this particular company, this group of people in this moment for whatever that season is. So I think that's the flipped model that I um, sort of live by and maybe others do if you um, profess faith in Christ. Um, you know, it's not this it's not the sort of self-serving, it's not that's not driving. That's not the first thing that's there. It's certainly part of it. Obviously I don't want to be in some miserable job, but um, sometimes also God is using that as well, losing those places that we can talk about through failure. I think that that flip point, flip side of success is important to talk about as well. You know, like we're always we're afraid of failure, but failure teaches us the most. And I'm using an example of my husband, who's an architect, but he was in a job that was so difficult for a short period of time, but he felt that he needed to stay there. And he didn't know why until he left. And he got such incredible experience that he needed to get the next job. And if he hadn't stuck it out in that you know, not perfect space. So I think, again, I keep going back to that time, timeline of like, you know, not just doing it for the immediate, but there's a long game, right, and short game. So those things that you learn, you know, not so perfect, fancy, pinnacle, whatever, will give you the skills to be able to then get somewhere else later. You don't even know you're going to end up. So it's all, again, magical, a country. I'm in the same, but I, I'm not supposed to, well, I'm a euphonium player by trade, so I'm not supposed to have a job to begin with. And then I, I go, <laughs> brass players are laughing. So then uh, uh, I, I get this job, and then I don't like this job, and then I, well, I'm not supposed to have, I need to go sell shoes or do something else because this is it for me. And fast forward through two other, this is now my third reinvention. I'm a full time professor at a, Big deal university, and I have a bachelor's degree. You're not supposed to be able to have a full time degree like that. And so the, there's two traditional paths. Well, there's one super traditional path. You go to school until they're like, well, that's all the school we know how to give you. Now you have a doctorate and you go do your thing. And that can work. And uh, the other path is the weird one. And you, you, you. Uh, bounce forward and fail forward and learn from your mistakes and then you develop the set of credentials that like my job position 
was never posted anywhere. There, was, there is no such job posting for <laughs> euphonium, run the tuba band, freshman advisor, teach music entrepreneurship classes, and do other weird assigned uh, top, you know, like, that doesn't exist. But I happen to bring, mm -hmm. I, my approach, and I think it's a useful approach for any of you, is in every, uh, after the Air Force band one, in every situation I found myself in, I asked myself two questions. What can I learn from this new experience? Like what, how, what skills can I develop or, or who can I meet or how can I get better at being a human, adulting? And, and maybe these should have been reversed and, and many times were, how can I provide value here? What can I do in this organization or with this group that could help them get to where they're going? And to be a part of this team, be a part of this organization, and how can I bring value? And that is that was valid 2,000 years ago, and it will be valid 2,000 years from now. If your approach is, where can I provide value, and what can I learn from the situation, then it helps you overcome your shoe. Um, if you can try and keep those ideas forward, it, it's helpful, I think. And, I, and the, the, the last little bit that I'll add there is that each of you has an unfair advantage. And I tell this, I'm the advisor for the freshman class of School of Music every year. So 35 or 40 freshmen sit down with me. I sat down with them a few years ago. And I try and indicate to them that there is some special set of experiences, um, connections, where you're from, the languages you speak, the life experiences that you've had are your superpowers. And there's one of you gonna come down the pike. And so if you take the time, you know, we're talking a lot about asking questions and you know, asking and asking, and it also requires that you spend the time to listen for the response. So if you analyze, well, what, what are the things that are uniquely me? You're into Marvel superhero movies and you love cooking and you play the oboe. There is some weird combination of that stew that could turn into a way for you to live indoors and eat food. And we don't know what it looks like because the world is really different then we came along, and so the specifics of how to do anything, I would say are maybe not relevant, but the world is such a different place than when, when I was coming up in school. The internet was a, 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 a rumor, it was just a, a, a whisper. There was no social media, there were no cell phones. There, many of the jobs that exist now didn't exist. Many of the career fields didn't exist. and. Look at the last five years. The, the world that we're in is very, very, very different and shifting. And we don't know how it's going to play out yet. So in some ways, it's the Wild West. And how you want to move forward is, can be largely up to you. you. You kind of have to decide, do I need to be led or can I lead? And lead doesn't mean lead a, a, a team or a group of people, but lead your path. And so you know, if you do a little catalog of, yeah, I'm the only one that I know that has these opportunities or superhero powers, and then you can start to think about ways that you can deploy them, uh, hopefully for good. Yeah, yeah I have uh, what might seem bad news, but it's actually good news. Uh, so I work a lot with graduate students at Duke, medical students and divinity students, and a lot of them are in their early to mid-20s, and um, I tell them that I, I think, and I don't have, I don't have a, a lot of empirical evidence for this, but I think it's true, that the, one of the most challenging times to be an, like an American uh, young adult or adult is about age 25 or so. And I think that's because um, there's a, we live in a really complicated world. And uh, there's lots of data out there about you know, mental health on college campuses is not good and the trend lines are going in the wrong direction. And the same is true of, of high schoolers and adolescents and the same is true of young adults. And um, there's a lot of challenges out there. And when you're about 25, give or take a few years, um, you're no longer in um, the relatively structured like context of undergraduate work, or at least you kind of have a sense of like, I'm doing this, and I'm doing a major and finishing that and getting my degree. Um, but most, a lot of young adults are also aren't yet like in that kind of longer term settled commitments around things like relationships and where you're living and like where you consider home and, and career and other things. 
And so it can feel actually like kind of a complicated time because there's just a lot of discernment that's, that has to be done. And, and what, I, what I tell students is who are in that situation, and I was when I was 25, is um, like the good news is that it's okay, that you have time to figure things out. You have time to, to live. You don't have to worry that you're like missing out on life because you're not sure like where you're, what city you're supposed to live in or who you're supposed to be in relationship with. Or things. You have time to figure this out. And so the key is, what does it mean to like, attend to our hearts in those times and, and be comfortable with the not knowing? And then I think there's these, and I've had similar experiences, like that the way that my career in terms of my work has um, worked out, the way that my marriage has worked out, the way that lots of things in my life have worked out, they're not, they're not a master plan. Like, I didn't sit down when I was 18 and say, like, this is, I'm going to go to college, and I'm going to go to medical school, and I'm going to do further education. That would have been, like, kind of masochistic to think, you know, like, I'm going to be in school for that long. But it's one thing after another, like, one opportunity opens up, and I say, yeah, that makes sense. I'm going to walk through this door. And then another opportunity opens up. And then there's, and then an opportunity that I thought was there doesn't come along. And it's like, well, maybe, maybe that's not, maybe that's not what I'm supposed to do. And uh, for long it works out, and and you end up having a, a, a life that's like you couldn't have necessarily predicted, but it's uniquely yours, and it's and, and it's beautiful. And so, what does it mean to be able to to see the beauty in, in that? Um, I would also just say, as I said before, there's a lot of messages that get thrown at us and you all, especially that I think have to be resisted. I have a, a friend in Durham where I live in North Carolina, who is a Duke graduate, and he's in, uh, his name is Greg Mitchell, he's a good friend of mine, he's a Christian, and he's an assistant principal of a public elementary school in Durham. Uh, and he, um, he talks about, as a Duke undergraduate, going to the Duke Career Services Office when he was graduating and saying, I'm interested in teaching. And Duke doesn't have an education program, and, uh, or at least not a, not a large undergraduate teaching program. And, um, and uh, they said, well, like, you know, we don't have much for you. So there's like a whole wall of, like, this is back, you know, where everything's online. There's a whole wall of like brochures on law, and a whole wall of medicine, and a whole law of business and finance. And, and they said, like, well, here's, here's something, they had like one folder with, like, uh, with descriptions of like, like Northeastern private schools that were looking for somebody to teach there. And so he said, okay, I'll take that. So he, he ended up applying for one of those positions and he started teaching and he loved it. And he, he moved out of the private school context and he moved back to the South and he started teaching in a public school district and he found that he loved it. And, he, and he's really good at it. I mean, he's really good at his job and he loves his job and he stays in it because he feels called to it. And that's, I think, it, it's, it's such a beautiful example of like, like not resisting all of the messages that like, if you go to Duke, you're supposed to go to medical school, law school, or go into Wall Street or whatever. He refused that, and I think that was um, such a beautiful witness for me. Thank you for that. So, so I'm summarizing: resisting some messages that are, um, again, from from various groups, we'll say, um, popular messages, and then kind of like let it form. As I'm kind of carrying that, which is very difficult if you've been planning ever since. You know, we we hide, right? Um, so I, I wonder if our folks in the audience here, if you scan, I can share your questions with the group. Um, so if you can do that right now, am I in your way? Because I was told by a very wonderful member in the audience that I could be in someone's way. If you haven't scanned it yet, so please do. If you're not, I am. You know, I would say, if you don't mind me jumping in, I think that your, your lives are complicated in, in, in a way that ours work. And there's a very specific way, and that is social media. And if you participate in social media, and I, I, I don't, you should do what you, what you do you, you do you. But what I would say is be intentional about how you use social media. Be careful not to be used by social media and be aware that everybody is putting the best of them. It's a, it's a very carefully curated, keyhole into people's lives. And it's easy to get um, sucked into believing that that's just, everybody's better than me, everybody's working harder than me, everybody's eating more beautiful food than I am, everybody's better at Wordle than I am. And it's, it's not the case. We don't often 
uh, uh, put our failures up for everyone to see. You don't put the picture of yourself that is less than flattering, or, or heaven forbid, unretouched. Mm -hmm. And so just remember, if you're going to participate in social media, that it is, it is a false glimpse at someone's idea of an ideal. Yeah, it's another identity of achievement, right? Do we receive our identity? We heard before, do we achieve our identity? And I think social media is like one of those things people are, are crafting at. So I have a question from someone from the, from the audience, and I do hope you all are, are adding some, remember this is the suggest tab um, in the, in the um, site there. Um, if you're not sure what that is, I'm sure if you raise your hand, somebody could, somebody could help you. So I have one question here that says, one worldview that exists within the modern career conversation is the idea of finding a job or work that you enjoy or have a passion in. What are your thoughts on this worldview? Does a job have to be something you enjoy doing or can it just be something that, you know, simply pays the bills? Does it, you know, so is this a tension that we have to live with um, or are you supposed to be passionate about what you do? That was good. Um, there's a story a little bit that sort of relates to this that might help, I think. Um, a few years ago, um, we came back from a degree to teach seniors in the capstone course. And um, we were supposed to be the first day looking at their portfolios, and they kind of didn't have them <laughs> ready. And there were some that was a little terrifying. So the teacher and I went off to lunch break. We're like, what is going on? So we gathered the class together, and they um, very honestly shared with us that they had been looking at the previous year's graduation students who were super talented and blah, blah, blah. Some of them didn't have jobs. And the anxiety was really palpable. They were, they were paralyzed. You know, the parents were like, OK, fine, the semester Parsons. Like, we want some return on our investment here. We want the job. You know, we want you to um, be moving out into the world. And then we started to have a conversation with them about the sort of multiplicity of the job world. Like again, I think when we graduated, or myself at least, there was a very singular kind of path. You would have one job, um, and certainly within fashion context, you would move up within a particular you know, hierarchy of like, start at the bottom, there's an assistant designer, you associate to that, to that, to that, you pay your dues and you move up. All of that is gone now, and for better or worse, um, I see students that come out and go straight into an associate position. Anything is possible, and I think that's something that you mentioned earlier, and really resonated, and we started to talk to the students about um, what the job market looked like. Um, that you will, may have, this may only be specific to like maybe the artist field more so, I don't know, um, where you may have the freelance job, so you will have the job that's paying the rent. And we've had these conversations with our students, um, where you, for us it would be the technical designer who's designing these technical flat sketches of all of things you're wearing. Not exciting, not a passionate moment, or a job you're excited about, but high paying. So we, we have intentional conversations with our students about if you're really, really brilliant in technical design, you will get that job, you will make a lot of money, and you will have the time to then also have your passion project on the side, um, or pursue whatever that other thing is that you're passionate in. So I don't think they're necessarily going to pick a job because they're, gonna, they're not going to be miserable in that job, but it may not be their dream job, or the one that they're passionate in, but it facilitates something else, so I think it's just a different landscape of not looking at that singular job to fulfill um, all of those pieces of your passion and things you love. You know, and again, to something Lance said, you know, we talked to them about their holistic selves. Like, they come to school to become a fashion designer, but what on earth does that really mean? Or what does it mean to be a doctor? He said, you know, they're not singular things, they're very multifaceted and their those jobs and you are multifaceted people so we really try to tease out from our students all of the things that they love to do so i mean my husband i'm talking about my husband but uh you know he he loved being an architect he's not doing that at the moment for lots of reasons but he finds joy in other things he wants to go he loves to do there's other parts of his life where he's passionate about where he finds the creativity is showing up and there's different seasons of your life where one thing or another, um, where one thing will kind of 
come to the fore and another thing will sort of take the back seat. So I think, yes, there are times where you, you, you take the job that will facilitate something else. That's a real thing. And it's not, and it also isn't a failure to do that. I mean, it's just, you know, be smart about it. If you have a high paying offer, get the job because then you can be looking for the other job that will, you will be more passionate and fulfilled in. But this, it's better to be looking for a job. I mean, have a job as well, but I think, you know, there's lots of strategies, but. I, I think the language of passion is kind of a trap that, that it, it often, and that's, it's a trap that I fell into in medical school, I think, because I was like, if I'm not passionate about what I'm doing, if, then, I, then I must be doing the wrong thing. Um, I, I do think that, as, I do think that we learn what we're to do in part by what brings joy to us and what we find satisfaction in. But I'd rather use the language of joy than, than passion. I realize they could be similar, but uh, I think that, that, first of all, there's no career job in existence, I think, that one can be passionate about all the time. I love being a psychiatrist, but I'm not passionate every single minute that I'm seeing patients. You know? I mean, often I'm just trying to kind of get through a day and, and figure out how to how to do the best I can. And and I don't think I, I don't think that's a fair like, thing to hold over myself or any, any of us. Um, I do think that joy is important, um, but I also think it's one of those messages that institutions send to us. So again, I'm at Duke. I'm not at Pitt or CMU, but at Duke. Like, you know, the message that undergraduates get is basically from the, from the university is basically like, you all are amazing. We have accepted you because you're amazing. And therefore, take these resources that we have to offer and go and do great things and follow your dreams. And I think that's a recipe for anxiety because, um, because first of all, like, how do, how do you know of, of all these different things what to do? And, and how do you just go out and do great things? I, I, I'd much rather the university say, um, you know, we've accepted you all, and the fact that you made it through this very competitive process means that you've already been ground down in some ways in a system that is like focused on achievement and competition and like hard work, and you're, you already are used to like padding CVs and knowing yourself. So what we want you to do here is to learn how to love. Like love yourselves and love others, to learn how to take the time and space to understand what you love, to actually experience a kind of deeper, subtle joy and not just like excitement about some new thing. Um, I, don't, I don't think any university does that very well. And it, 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 you know, that could happen to Duke, but it's not the message that people get. But I, I think that career satisfaction comes more from like having a kind of long, settled, Commitment to to a, a craft or to a uh, to a practice or to especially a people or to to others that that allows then the joy to be there even when the passion in, even when the passion in any given day is not. I I, I think you're both dead on. I think and I, what what I'm hearing or what what occurs to me is that if you're fortunate enough to find a portion of your career or bless you if you have a big chunk of your career where you are both uh, fulfilled and charged and you're able to live indoors and eat food off of that. That's a gift. That's really a rare thing. And it's okay to be happy and satisfied with a pretty decent job where they treat me well. It's a fair trade for what I give them and what they give me and it allows me the freedom to go do these other things that I'm passionate about, that I know make me a full human, and that allow me to go share my gifts in lots and lots of other ways. And it's okay if it doesn't, you don't pop out of bed like, hey boss, can't wait to come see you today. That's all right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, when, when there's research done on career satisfaction, then it's interesting like what shows up and what doesn't. So, so money ends up mattering to the point that uh, people need to have a, a, enough income to live on, you know, and so uh, that's important, but not beyond that. So, like, money doesn't drive satisfaction. Rich people just have rich people's anxieties and fears in some cases, and prestige doesn't drive satisfaction or perceived prestige of a career. What tends to drive satisfaction 
within professions are things like, um, do you, does someone find meaning in what they do? Is it for something? Um, and which I think is different from passion. It's more a sense of like, what am I, what am I doing here? Um, another is, uh, do people find in their work, do they find some place of agency and autonomy? Is it like, can you exercise some creativity and freedom in what you do? And that might be like, in kind of how you arrange your work hours. It could be how you exercise leadership. Are you able to you know, make changes in your organization, that kind of thing. Um, another really important one is like, do you like and respect the people that you work with? And do they respect you? And I mean, working in an abusive work environment or a school environment is not good for mental health, and it's not, I think, what any of us are called to do. Um, and and I think that does matter. But I mean, people can be in a in a position that may not be their absolute passion job, but they really like the people that they're around and they work with, and that goes a really long way. And uh, I would add maybe a, another to that is that um, having some some like variability where you're doing, you know, maybe it's different things on different days or maybe have different sets of things over the course of a year, but um, something that allows for some like rhythm of a, of a job, not, not just the exact same thing every single day, uh, helps I think to just help people to find some balance. But in terms of what the, what the research shows on like when people like their jobs, what is it? It's those kinds of things. And those kinds of things can be found in an awful lot of different lines of work. They can be found among professors, but they can also be found in lots of other ways. And uh, I think the good news is that like, those are things that are like, attainable. So what I'm hearing is purpose isn't necessarily <laughs> the same thing as passion, which I think is you know, one of the, the theme for tonight is you know, how do I find my purpose um, as I look at career and mental health. And you can't define yourself only by your career. It's not a holistic view of yourself. We have another question here. Have you had any doubts or regrets so far in your careers? And if so, how did you deal with them? Any healthy suggestions? Doubts or regrets? I've only had doubts um, so far every day of my career. <laughs> <laughs> I think I go back to the thing that I said earlier, me personally, which is, I uh, ask uh, two questions of myself, which is uh, what, what do I have to learn here and how can I contribute? And if the, I think failure feels really um, powerful. At, uh, when I was in my early 20s, failure felt much more traumatic than it does to me now. And I've had numerous ventures, musical groups, opportunities, things that I've been involved in that just I was convinced were going to be the next big thing and all just totally tanked. And in every one of those instances, there was something I learned out of it or somebody I met out of it or a relationship that I built or a perspective or, you know, the way your brain comes up with a new habit or you learn to do a thing. There's a, 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 a here I'm on stage with the doctor, I'm in big trouble. Uh, if I start, like, I'll, if I get in trouble, just push me off the stage, because <laughs> I know you can heal me. So, um, you have this initial uh, notion that happens in your brain, and two synapses fire simultaneously, there's a connection, there, a connection that happens. And the more frequently that happens, there's this thin coating called myelin that will, that will um, insulate and protect that thing. And so the more often I've gone through the procedure, I've been on stage a few thousand times, and I'm confident that even him pushing me off the stage, I'll figure out a way to deal with it. Because I've done it enough times, I've failed enough times, that I know that it isn't fatal. One day it might be, but right now, and hopefully not tonight, it isn't. <laughs> and so it's a recognition that doubt is part of the process, there's a great book called um, The War of Art by a guy named Stephen Pressfield. And uh, he's a, a, an author. And it's a, not a very uh, thick book, maybe 150 pages maybe. Uh, and there's an incredible uh, uh, concept in there, which is the resistance. And the resistance is the thing, it's doubt, and it's fear, and it's judgment. And he, his position, which is my position, because uh, I stole it from him, 
is that you can run from the resistance. You can say, uh-oh, mountain lion, and go that way. Or you can use the resistance as a compass and let it guide you because it's a place that's uncomfortable and maybe there's growth there, maybe there's opportunity there. And it's uncomfortable, but if you head in that direction, then it might lead you to the thing that you need. And so to overcome that doubt, you might need to listen to what is the thing that I'm running from? What is it that I'm afraid of? What, what am I afraid people are going to find out? And, and march in that direction and find out what growth can happen there. What, what new territory? You have those dreams sometimes where you are in your house and you open a door and then there's all of a sudden another house in there that you didn't know was ever there. And maybe you're on the precipice of a, an experience like that, but for the fear of, of looking dumb or failing or I don't know what. Most of the time, I'll, one last thing. I, I, when I'm coaching musicians, stage fright is a real paralyzing experience for many, many people. And so I, uh, I put them through the and then what exercise. And the and then what exercise is, who would be nervous about coming up on stage? And someone raises their hand and I would say, okay, what are you afraid would happen? And they say, I'm afraid I would mess up. And, and I would say, and then what? And then people would laugh. And then what? Eventually they'd stop laughing. And then what? I guess I'd start playing again. Okay, so very few times in history has somebody said, I might mess up, and then what? Famine. Highly unlikely in a recital situation. My toenails all shot right out of the end of my feet. Like, we fatalize these things and get, we make these monsters so big. And sometimes we just need to turn the light on and look under the bed and go, yeah, everything's okay. So the and then what exercise, eventually you find Okay, what am I all, you know, bound up about? And often it's not the boogeyman that you think it is. It's a neat cognitive strategy. <laughs> I like that a lot. <laughs> and that, that fear, I wonder, I wonder, if, actually, Warren, can you talk a little bit about that fear? Like, fears that, when you, if, what if you can't do that anymore? Because it's helpful when you have the coach, mm. right? But what if you're, what if you're by yourself? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I uh, defer to the music educator about, about stage fright, but I think that uh, it is true that I think we we often um, we often catastrophize like things that are going to happen. That uh, that I, I love what I said that failure is such a good teacher. And I've, I've heard, so I'm in a very risk averse profession. You know, like doctors don't like to fail. Maybe maybe that's good. But uh, I heard somebody say recently who had been involved in the tech industry in Silicon Valley, uh, this may have been a little hyperbolic, but he said that, like, um, that some tech companies don't actually like to hire somebody unless they've previously had a business fail because they are able to put things in perspective and they know how to take risks and they know how to weigh um, what's worth doing. Now, that's a long way from my own life as an academic physician. Uh, but it's something that I think uh, that, that sounds really interesting, almost kind of like giving that you're failing and, and uh, not be, uh, have to live in shame of the path, but to see it as an opportunity. I think to the question, I mean, I have lots of doubts in my own life. I, I have imposter syndrome still, you know, as like a good career professor where I, I worry, like, you know, do I belong here at this particular zone of conversation that I'm in, or, or we're going to find me lacking in some ways. I have to fight that. It's partly my perfectionism that comes in. Um, in terms of regrets, I don't know. I, I, I do think I regret um, early in my career in education. I kind of did school and school and school and never really took a break. So I went from undergrad to medical school and then residency and graduate school. And, and there was lots of beauty in that. But I actually do regret not having at least one year where I wasn't in an educational setting. I encourage, when people say they're thinking about doing that, I say, if you can swing it, that sounds like a really wonderful thing to be able to do. Um, and uh, and I, think, I think opportunities to slow down early on in life, uh, even when it feels countercultural and hard, I, I do think most of the time that pays off in the long run. 
not just economically, but in terms of just what it means to, to live and love well. I can go to the next one. Like, it's, not, it's, it's not really done fear story, but it's uh, it's a sort of failure opportunity story, which is sort of related to what both you know, Lance and Warren are saying. I think that um, you know, the pinnacle dream of opening your own business, having your own label, seeing your name on the door, so to speak, on um, the backs of people slowly, you know, it happened and I showed a fashion did all of the things, right? That was like the success moment. But I remember um, being called into that moment, stepping forth in that as a believer. And that sense again, going back to what you were saying, Lauren, but you know, because we're called feeling like, you know, okay, because I'm stepping out of faith, I was very sure that God was calling me to this. That sense of like, well, it, it can't fail. And you know, what if it fails? What does that mean on that level existentially as well? as everything else in terms of the horizontal world and just terms of like putting yourself out there and then say which did happen closing business um you know and i think going into that it was terrifying because i think from the very beginning i was dreading that moment that it wouldn't succeed whatever that meant um that i would still be in business for the rest of my life and become this big brand or whatever that was in the frame of success was going to be um, and so when, it, when I had to make the decision to close the business financially every which way, it was absolutely devastating to me. It was like a death um, of a dream, like science dramatic, but I was literally like sobbing in my, I would wake up sobbing for days to a point where my husband was like distraught, like what am I going to do with her? Not her, <laughs> not in a non loving way. Uh, <laughs> What's, you know, what's going on? And it was a real death to me. Um, but there was, and those of you that um, you know, do have a faith position and are Christian, you know, there was definitely this still small voice that literally I heard was like, um, you love this too much, Fiona. You love this more than me, it has to go. And it was painful and very deeply, profoundly life altering because I had put this dream of this thing, of this success, and it was I don't, it was defining me, it just goes back to what I said at the beginning of not letting it define me because it had defined me. And my faith that who I was in God was not leading, it was not top, it was this dream of fashion. And it had to get it had to get it out of the way. But graciously I was able to have realized that dream for seven years. But the failure of that and closing of that opened the door to this entire career in education, which I, of course, had no idea at that moment. But I think the doubts and the fears were all fully realized. You know, I had the stage fight and I was pushed on the stage and I stood up again. You know, so it's like that, you know, verse that comes to our mind, um, you know, except to if we fall to the earth and die. You know, you have, there has to be a death in certain ways in some of these moments. Of, these dreams, I think, before you can move to the next stage. And it's painful, but you do make it through, and you, you know, there is a bigger thing on the other side of that opportunity. opportunity. Just as you're, as you're quoting that scripture, and we've been talking about failure, I mean, we are meeting this week on the week that Christians mm -hmm. uh, observe Holy Week, and, you know, for the disciples uh, of Jesus who were, like, present when their leader was executed, and they had thought that in some way he was going to somehow like lead Israel somehow out of Roman oppression, and then he was dead. I mean, that they had to reckon with the fact that this whole thing that we've given our lives to and that he's preached is is, is a failure. And uh, and even when he he was raised and they witnessed him, uh, they still had to deal with the loss of those previous expectations. There was a process of like, what does this mean that this has not worked out? As good as this might be, it has not worked out in the way that we thought it was going to. And they spent, frankly, years trying to figure that out. And that wrestling is in part like what gave rise to Christian faith. So failure teaches us a lot. Maybe even like for Christians, maybe baked into like some of what we have to do when we like have um, dreams of what our messiahs are going to deliver. And then we meet the messiah 
who comes to us in a form that we don't expect. So I'm gonna I'm gonna go to a question here that came a little bit later because I think it's a, maybe a little bit related to this. How have you balanced fulfilling your responsibilities, your perceived responsibilities, with respecting respecting your emotional and physical limits and minimizing burnout? Can you read that again? Yes. How have you balanced fulfilling responsibilities or your perceived responsibilities with respecting your emotional and physical limits and minimizing burnout? So I was thinking earlier about what we said about your holistic view of yourself. Is this is this something I'm, you know, this is the only thing you're living for, you know, um, maybe being afraid of that failure, right, or that doubt, right? I'm, I'm wondering about that connection to burnout. Maybe there isn't one, but um, <laughs> um, I think that sometimes if we hit pause on something we're very passionate about, we think it's gone forever. And I think that, I know that I set out with many of us at the beginning of the year, here's the things I'm going to try to accomplish this year. I'm going to write this thing or record this whatever or do this, this, or da 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 And life happens, and then I have to analyze, do I still have room in my life to do those things? Is it, this will add additional stress or additional time away from home or additional resources, be they energy, cash, whatever it is. And sometimes I have to remind myself that saying no to an opportunity uh, isn't permanent. It's not forever. It can be a not now. And it might just be that the most important thing that you can do right now is to keep the lights on and make sure that rent gets paid and make sure that there's food in the fridge and make sure that you can, you know, <laughs> survive another day and that and have the faith and hope and train for and learn for and be on the lookout for the um, slack in the system that will allow you to pick up some of these things. It's, you know, we're, we've been sort of talking around Maslow's hierarchy of needs to some degree and the lower you go on the hierarchy of needs, like if it's shelter, then that's job number one. And if it's you've got to feed your family, then you've got to feed your family, and that's what you have to do. And uh, it doesn't fulfill me. Well, it fills you, like, with food, and so then you should keep doing that until and unless, or until, I should say, such time that you can start to look for other ways to get those itches scratched. And it's difficult because there's this thing I really want to do, but my obligations are such that I, I have to do this. And if I try and do both, I, I'm gonna make myself miserable, I'm gonna exhaust myself, I'll be no good to anybody, I'll be surly, I'll be sleep deprived, I may make myself sick, like it's a downward spiral. And so... Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna push on this a little bit. Yeah. I like that you brought up Maslow's hierarchy of needs, and I'm like, yeah, that's good. But think about students, and students, students are, uh, living according to the schedules of their faculty who are yep. putting things on them. They're not maybe thinking about, you know, like, uh, like what about at that level? I'm burnt out because I have all this work to do and I gotta give 100% of everything. Like that, you know what I mean? Like, uh, is that fair? Like, the, at that level, like, where I am is that I'm in my sophomore, junior year and I wanna do all these things and I'm applying for jobs and I might want to be in a relationship and I might want to cook every now and then and not eat hot dogs all day. You know, or, you know, so like as that space, how do you avoid burnout? I mean, it's the same principle, I think. What does it look like? I'll say a quick thing and then shut up because I've been talking a lot. But the, the, my single most important piece of advice to every student is to not keep that a secret. To go tell your professors, go tell your advisors, Tell you like talk. Don't internalize it because if the I can tell you I can guarantee you the students who come to me and say I'm struggling right now 
those are the students, I'll do anything I can to help. We'll figure out a different way for you to turn this thing in. Is there another way you can deliver that, whatever it is? And you open yourself to resources that you didn't have, but too often we feel because everybody else is doing it, I have to do it. Well, not everybody else is doing it. Or maybe you don't know what anybody else is doing. And if it's too much for you, then say something to somebody who can, I, it, I have students who come through my classes and I can tell something's up and they, if I say, hey, how's it going? They say, I'm fine. And then they never set up a meeting with me and they, they kind of, I can see them listing a little bit in the, in the eddy of life. And others where I see it and they go, can I have 10 minutes? And then an hour and a half later, we've talked through, here's a thing, okay, tomorrow, what's a single thing you can do to get you down the road? So don't, don't um, I would just wish for you that you wouldn't keep it a secret. So go, go tell somebody. 